Hello everyone, thanks for tuning into part one of the seventh winter 2021-2022 update from Gaz Weatherly. So here we go, it's time to bring you uh, another winter update and we've reached a halfway point now of our winter updates actually update number seven uh you know marks a halfway point we've got 13 pencils in so um yeah we've perhaps seen a little bit beyond the halfway point but we've definitely reached like halfway now and uh, and so the data starts getting a little bit more pivotal uh from this point on once we get halfway and beyond um you know we start presenting like our uh, our um solar data and our, our um sort of teleconnection data like the qbo uh and enso and whatnot so uh so yeah we're reaching the busy end of the updates now everybody we've had a lot of fun over the past sort of uh, six updates up to now uh, but now this is when things start getting serious. And so the seventh update is going to be a solar special. Um, we're going to be presenting our solar analogs in part two of this uh, update. It's going to be released at 6 p.m. tomorrow. So um, you'll be able to see how the winters for this part of the solar cycle that we picked out, uh, you know, are looking in terms of whether they're cold winters or mild winters and uh, whatnot and that's going to be coming up in part two tomorrow but we're going to bring you lots of solar data in this one as well there's the final part the final, final section i suppose of this seventh winter update part one um that will be sort of uh very much towards the, the solar um stuff so uh, that's coming up later on but before then we've got all of the other stuff like sea service temperature anomalies and uh and the hurricane season eurasian so cover as well being developments there so uh we've got all of that to come and stratos stratosphere data too so all of that is to come uh, in this video as well. It's going to be an epic, it's going to be a long one, it's going to be an epic video. So uh, please like, share, subscribe. Thank you so much, everybody, um, for doing that. Uh, I'm just going to say that the first video released there was our 7 a.m. forecast. And also, uh, we're going to be live streaming at uh, 6 p.m. My birthday as well. So as well as this uh, seventh update part one, it is also uh, my birthday too. So um, yeah, we'll have a chat about this seventh update, of course, I suppose, on live stream. Uh, but it's going to be a birthday live stream as well. And we'll show you some long race. It's going to be an epic, epic live stream. And uh, that's going to be coming up from uh, 6 p.m. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be amazing. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for uh, giving me such a special day. Uh, right, I guess thank you so much to uh, Rich and to Shrine. Now, we've got a, we've got a different... Uh, winter updates gif uh, for this one. Uh, so Rich has done um, a special gif for us for, for part one of this seventh uh, winter update uh, sort of special. So thank you so much, Rich, for for the uh, gif for uh, for this one. Uh, you will also see the traditional gif later on in video as well. Don't worry about that, everybody. But thank you so much to Rich for the gifts and for all the help on this video. You're going to see loads of um, data from Rich starting with a swingometer in a moment, actually, by the way. Um, so you'll see how the swingometer has moved any moment uh, after last week's sixth update. More about that in a second. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you so much to Rich. Also, thank you so to Shryan as well. Thank you so much to Shryan Bruin for all of the help on this uh, video as well. Shryan has been updating our um, our uh, ACE page and whatnot, and also solar data coming from Shryan later on in video two. So it's going to be great. It's going to be epic. It's going to be loads and loads in this video. Thank you so much to Richard. Thank you so much to Shryan for all of the help uh, on this one. Uh, amazing and incredible. Thank you so much both. Right, I think that's pretty much everything I'm going to tell you. This is going to be a very long video, so uh, you can't watch it one go, don't worry, it will be kept on the Gaz Webbers YouTube um, homepage and on the playlist within that homepage. So you'll be able to come back for winter updates, so you'll be able to come back and watch the video whenever you like on demand and, uh, and so on. And that's going to be absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, everyone. Right, so the first thing we've got to do is bring you the swingometer. So uh, I'm going to show you any moment how the swingometer is looking as of uh, last week's sixth update. Remember, the swing swingometer is based on every single update. It just changes week by week as we add another update to it. But this swingometer is showing you how winter updates, you know, uh, are favouring, whether they're favouring a milder or a colder than average winter, up to update number six. So we've got update number one to update number six, including the NAA forecast. As well, everything is included in the swingometer. This is how it's uh, looking, man. So, should we count this down? Shall we count this down? Okay, let's do this. Three, two, one.
Here we go, and the Gauss Weathers Winter 2021-2022 Swing Orbiter is currently favouring a milder than average winter by 53% to 47%. By 53% to 47%, we are saying that our winter updates up to the end of update number 6 favouring a milder than average winter by 53 to 47%. That includes all of that September data, of course, that we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks, and we are now finished with September data. So uh, there we go, 53 to 47, milder than average winter is favoured up to update number six. That's what the swingometer is saying. You will find out at the beginning of next week's eighth update uh, how this seventh update has affected the swingometer, whether it's moved the swingometer further into uh, mild or whether we've had a swing back to cold, where we just stay where we are. You'll find out at the beginning of next week's eighth update. That is a very slight swing, by the way, to mild from last week. Last week we was at 52 to 48 for a mild of an average winter. Now we're 53 to 47. So that's a very, very slight further swing to uh, mild after the sixth update. But uh, yeah, you will find out next week how the seventh update has affected things. Thank you so much to Richard. Thank you so much, Rich, for this week's uh, Swingometer. Okay, right, let's crack on then. So we're going to start the webcam. I'm going to start off by having a look at Oceans data. This is how the Oceans were looking when we did last week's uh, SIF, Winter 2021-2022 update. This is our, as of the 8th of October. We've got our four areas of interest. We've got the Enso region just here. We've got the Northern Pacific over there, particularly focused on the Northeastern Pacific. We've got the Indian Ocean here, and we've got the North Atlantic Ocean uh, just there. So that is how the Oceans were looking last week. This this is the very latest. So let's deal with the Enso region first of all. We have seen a further cooling of the Enso uh, region. The Cinture Falania has strengthened, particularly in the central part of the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, all regions of the Equatorial Pacific, however, have got colder than average sea surface temperature anomalies. Very much, uh, you know, the signature of landing. It has strengthened slightly in that central part of the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. It's going to be a landing in winter. There's no two ways about that. It's just a question of how strong will the landing be. Going further north to the northern Pacific. This is the area we're focusing on uh, just now. Let's go back to last week. That's how it looked in that area last week. This is the very latest. Let's have a look then. You can see that we have seen a further cooling in the northeastern Pacific Ocean. So we're all, we've almost got a horseshoe uh, now, shape of coal. It's uh, significantly cold and average uh, up there around uh, Alaska and Canada and North America. Also just here off, uh, off California and whatnot. So yeah, we have almost got a horseshoe shape of coal. Just need to turn that area a little bit cooler. Just there, that little stubborn area of yellow needs to go blue. And then we will have the classic horseshoe shape of coal which is, of course, the cold of an average PDO uh, signature Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, so to the south of the actual, actual Pacific Ocean, it has gone quite cold there, from Chile up to the equator. Um, so, so cold and average sea surface temperature is there, cooling down in the northern uh, and northeastern Pacific. This is all in response to this uh, La Nina, of course. So uh, La Nina is like warming, uh, cyclical warming, uh, or annual, I suppose, warming and cooling of the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. And uh, this is turning down the thermostat, really, this La Nina. So we are cooling the oceans down um, at the moment, Pacific, but eventually this will probably have a cooling effect on the wider ocean circulation uh, as well. So, yeah, definitely getting colder in the Pacific. Let's move over to the Indian Ocean, have a look at that. So that's how the Indian Ocean was looking uh, last week. This is how the Indian Ocean is looking this week. No real changes. We still have a neutral uh, sort of neutral to negative signature for the IOD. It's cooler there. It's warmer there. Uh, so that would be uh, a neutral uh, signature for the Indian Ocean Dipole, if not slightly uh, negative. And then over in the North Atlantic, again, let's go back to last week. This is how the North Atlantic was looking uh, when we did last week's update. This is the very latest. Here we go. Very little change. Uh, really still generally warm and average across most parts of the North Atlantic, especially uh, around here. It has cooled a little bit, perhaps through the tropical Atlantic, but it's still generally on the warm and average side. Still looking very warm through the Gulf of Mexico, around the Caribbean, into the southeastern part of, uh, of America, off the southeastern coast of America. Still warm through there. So I think, I don't think the hurricane is going 
going to see data in the moment from the hurricane season. I, I don't think the hurricane season is done, though. To me, it looks like we see so temperature lowers are still primed for further development. So we see we go for a bit of a low, but I reckon this will start picking up again in the next week or two. But we'll see about that. But generally, very little change in the North Atlantic from uh, last week to this week. Um, so, so yeah, you know, uh, not much change. Generally warm and average in most areas. This is a seven-day uh, change. So, this is a seven-day trend for the oceans. Um, let's have a look at the Ensa region, first of all. So, uh, some parts of the Ensa region have warmed a little bit over the past seven days, over here in the eastern actual Pacific Ocean and in the far west, too. Got a little bit warm there, but conversely, through this central area, it has actually turned colder. No real change in the Indian Ocean, differing, you know, uh, in, in uh, warming areas. Generally, it's warmed up a little bit, I think, in the Indian Ocean over the past seven days, but up here we have cooled a little bit. The main changes are in the northern Pacific and the North Atlantic, I have to say. So, uh, in the northern Pacific, you can see that things have cooled quite significantly right way down that western coast of America, from Alaska all the way down to Mexico. Um, things are cooling significantly there. That is in response, I'm sure, to the uh, landing. Uh, in the Atlantic, things have got warmer through the tropical Atlantic. Things have cooled over the past seven days um, towards Newfoundland and towards the east coast of America. And maybe things have warmed a little bit up here. Could that be moving towards a tripole? We wonder about this every week, don't we? But that does look a little bit tripole-esque, I have to say. Um, so we'll see how that develops. Could we start seeing the freeway band of warm over cool over warm beginning to uh, set up there? Be interesting to see how that goes over the next few days. A week's wage. This is how things are looking at depth in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, by the way, this is from the ENSO PDF, uh, which is updated weekly by CPC, NCEP, and NOAA. So uh, these are the depths of the ocean just here, of the, uh, of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is like the equator of the Pacific Ocean just here. That's uh, Peru over there, and this is Indonesia over here. So you can see that at depth, we have got a large mass of cold and average subsurface temperature lowers now underneath the surface of the actual Pacific Ocean, particularly from around sort of 50 to, let's say, 150 to 200 metres. That area there getting significantly uh, colder. Over in the western part of the uh, actual Pacific Ocean at depth, it's warming up a little bit there. That might be, you know, precursor towards um, a warm event next year, but at the moment it's very much those cold and average uh, sea and subsurface temperature lowers that are holding sway the sea for La Nina is uh, very much in evidence. Of course, if these um, if these uh, subsurface temperatures don't break to the surface, um, then it won't be a particularly strong La Nina. But that is quite a quite an anomaly there, actually, at depth, um, going down to like four to six degrees below average. So if that starts moving up to the surface, this La Nina could start to uh, strengthen and power up. CFS V2 is forecasting that to happen. So uh, the temperature norm is on the side. This is for the Enso region, central part of the Enso region. Temperature on the side, dates in monthly periods are along the bottom. So you can see that we're starting off around there, just a little bit below average. Um, but by the time we get through to like December, the CFS V2 was have us near two degrees below average, which would be like a strong landing, probably the strongest landing we've had since 1988-1989. However, the CFS does this like it did this last year, overdoes the draw. So in the end, I reckon I still say we're gonna pull up short of that. And, and do something like that with the black dash line in the end, rather than taking it down to like two degrees below average, we will pull up somewhere around one to one and a half degrees below average. But we'll see, you know, we'll see. We'll find out definitely in the next month or two. Last year it overdid the strength of the landing. I think it's probably doing that again, but we shall see, um, you know, over the next few months. S to Y is looking like this. Solar oscillation index is just an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state. Measuring air pressures between Tahiti and Darwin doesn't drive anything in its own terms, just tells what the atmosphere is doing. Uh, this is from uh, Queensland Government, part of Bureau of Meteorology. So uh, it's provisional, but they don't tend to change the SY numbers all that much. These are the date uh, columns just here from the 16th of October 
uh, down to the fifth of October, for example. That's a column for barometric pressure for Tahiti. That's a column for barometric pressure for Darwin. And then that's the overall SOI number. When the SOI is in its positive phase, the atmospheric setup will be reflective of La Nina. When the SOI is in its negative phase, and the atmospheric setup will be reflective of El Nino. You can see that uh, we have got a lot of positivity. So sorry, everybody. A lot of positivity of the SOI. Uh, on the 8th of October at plus 13, for example. 9th of October, we're at plus 2. 11th of October, we're at plus 2. Again, 12th of October, we're at plus 12. Wow, 13th of October at plus 14. 16th of, uh, 14th of October, I should say, at plus 16. 15th of October at plus 21. And the latest day, 16th of October, we've got here, is at plus 28.43. Very strong positivity of the Southern Oscillation Index telling us that uh, the atmospheric setup is very, very much in a landing uh, type setup. Now, that's keeping the uh, 30-day SOI average strongly positive. That's this red line. Just here, you can see how strongly positive the SOI 30-day average is at around plus 11. The 90-day average has dropped a little bit. That's the yellow dashed line. But it's still in, in solidly positive territory. Everything is pointing to landing. The only question is how strong will the landing you be by the time you get into winter itself. Kind of connected to the oceans, particularly the Atlantic Ocean, but also to uh, ENSO, is what's going on with the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season. So uh, this is it. This is the uh, Atlantic hurricane season page from Wikipedia. Uh, and these are our scores on the doors. Let's have a look then. So let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's look. So, uh, so far this season, we have had uh, 20 tropical depressions we have had 20 tropical storms we've had seven hurricanes and we've had four major category three or above hurricanes those numbers are completely unchanged on last week there's been no fresh developments since last week's uh, update this is how ACES is currently looking. This has been updated by Shryam. Thank you so much to Shryam Brewing for updating uh, this. So ACES accumulated cyclone energy is, you know, just kind of uh, reflecting the strength of these energy, that these storms are, how much energy these storms, and the strength of them, uh, you know, how much energy they are giving out. So each individual storm has its own amount of energy that it emits, and eventually that is all calculated into one sort of big ACE number. ACES is classified as below normal, near normal, above average, and hyperactive. We can go all the way back to 1851 with uh, ACE. Let's go down through the uh, years then, and we come down to the current year of 2021. There it is, and uh, you can see that ACE is currently standing at 139.50, which does make this season above average. Not hyperactive yet, but definitely above average for ACE for the 2021 hurricane season and that is after 20 uh 20 uh tropical storms seven hurricanes and four major hurricanes um and that is unchanged on uh, last week actually this is how things are looking as we go into uh the sixth winter update last week so uh last week's eighth number was also at 139.50 after 20 storms, 7 hurricanes, and 4 major hurricanes. So there's been no developments at all. The whole week has been, you know, completely shut down. Uh, but I still think there's more to go with this hurricane season. I still think we're probably going to end up hyperactive, but we shall see. Time will tell. At the moment, things have definitely shut down a lot. How that compares to the overall uh, running average. So um, at this point in the hurricane season, you expect to be at plus 90.90. Uh, after 10 storms, 5 hurricanes and 2 majors. So obviously we've had a much bigger season so far compared to average. And how that compares to this time last year when we were doing the 7th winter 2020-2021 update on the 18th of October. ACE then was at 123.10 uh, after 25 uh, tropical storms, 9 hurricanes and 3 majors. So actually ACE is a little, despite that the past week, um, the, the the um, tropical Atlantic hurricane season shut down over the past week. Despite that, ACE is actually higher now than it was at this point last season. So uh, we shall see if there's any developments over the next week, of course. Right, we've talked for nearly 20 minutes. We're going to pause the video there. When we come back, we're going to pick things up by having a look at the quasi-biennial oscillation and the strat and Eurasia show cover. Lots and lots to come. And then the third section of this video will start our solar special. 
Uh, but I'm going to pause the video there, and I'll see you back in around two seconds time. See you very soon. Okay, we're back, and we're ready to resume the second section of the 7th Winter 2021-2022 Update Part 1. If you enjoyed the video so far, please like, share, subscribe. We've got so much more to show you. It's amazing how much we're fitting into this update. You cannot find this content anywhere else online. So uh, I just hope you're enjoying this year's winter updates. And we, as I say, we are now at the halfway point. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, let's move on. Then we're going to start off this second section with the uh, QBO. Here we go. So this is from NASA. Um, so you can see that Eastern QBO is continuing to uh, develop and descend into the troposphere. So with this, you have to think that these are the layers of the atmosphere just here. That's the top of the atmosphere and strata at 10 HPA. This is the boundary level of the atmosphere called the troposphere from 30 to 50 HPA. This blue green area is the easterly phase of quasi being a station descending from the uh, stratosphere down into the troposphere. We are well and truly in the easterly QBO and uh, that is going to continue into this winter. You can see right at the very top of the atmosphere at the very top of the stratosphere, we have got a little bit of an indication of the westerly QBO up there. That will stay, you know, uh, um, sort of uh, locked in up there at the very top of the stratosphere, having no impact on the troposphere, on the boundary of the atmosphere, wherever it takes place. But it will sort of remain locked there um, until the next westerly QBO phase sort of descends in, in around sort of uh, um, probably around eight to nine months time, something like that. I would have thought second half of next year is when the next Western QBO will probably start to uh, descend from the strap to the drop. But at the moment, it's the Eastern QBO that's holding sway. You can see these dark blue colours here in the troposphere, but the Eastern QBO is well and truly in there. And they're very gradually, it takes a while, but very gradually it's sending further and further down into uh, the troposphere. So, yeah, this is going to be a strong uh, Easterly QBO uh, winter. And we may sort of look at the analogs of the. Um, for, the, for Eastern QBOs next week, actually. I think we'll do a bit of an Eastern QBO, or a bit of a QBO spec, um, probably with our analogues uh, next week. So I did say we'll start bringing you a lot more data, um, you know, uh, for in terms of teleconnections and that from this point onwards. And next week, I think you'll get to see uh, what uh, Easterly QBO winters are looking like. So that's going to be very exciting. Isn't it? Right, uh, Article Station Observer Forecast looks like this. Remember, the black line tells where we've been with the AO, Red Concept, the with GFS, and Sombers forecasting Article Station to go. Um, just an index that's reflecting the absolute state, doesn't drive anything in its own terms, just tells us what we actually do. And the AO is negative, we've got blocking over the Arctic and over the North Pole. When the AO is positive, we've got low pressure over the Arctic and over the North Pole at the moment. The AO is in a weekly negative phase. It's actually been forecast to go uh, rather strongly positive into the second half of October, interestingly, through the final week or so of the month. Looks like we're going strongly positive there with the AO low pressure developing over pole. At the same time, the NEO is looking like this, observed and forecast. So again, black line shows that at the moment the NEO is negative and is forecast by GFS ensembles to stay negative for the next week or so, maybe starting to move to a more positive phase as we come towards the end of October. So by end of October, we might be in a positive AO and NEO. That could be a signal for Westerlies to strengthen and the weather to be continue to be quite mild probably but also wetter and windy with low pressure coming in off the Atlantic. This our temperature is looking at 10 HPA over the uh, North Pole in the stratosphere. So this from the JMA of course the grey line shows uh, but at the moment in the cooling phase of the year in terms of temperatures at 10 HPA the black line shows that we're about bang on average uh, really with the temperature at 10 HPA in the stratosphere. So that flip, if we do get it, a flip to a positive uh, AO can't be sort of put down to stratospheric developments given that we are not overly cold at 10 HPA. And we're not overly cold at 30 HPA either. The black line, again, sticking very, very close to the long-term trend grey line. Uh, so uh, both at 10 and 30 HPA uh, stratospheric temperatures are around what you expect. There have been some um, rumours about a sudden stratospheric warming taking place over the uh, North Pole at 10 HPA. So this is the latest forecast 
from the GFS at Metro Ciel. You can see that we've got these blue colours in, indicating that, you know, they've got quite cold stratospheric temperatures, you'd expect. We're into the, when it's the autumn now, so you'd expect temperatures to be getting colder, as we see here on this. But, you know, the grey line does trend down all the way to, um, you know, all the way to, to January. So uh, we're in the cooling phase. You'd expect to see these blue colours over the Arctic and over North Pole. They're not excessively cold. That's about average, uh, as, as we've already established. There's a little bit of warming taking place over uh, over the Pacific side of Siberia. Let's run through and see if we can see any sort of indication of a substratic warming. So we are getting a warming that's occurring over Siberia there, who of course are next week. There is a stratospheric warming going on. It's not a sudden stratospheric warming. I think some people get a little bit confused between like minor warning warmings and sudden stratospheric warming. On these charts, you know you get a sudden stratospheric one because you'll go to the red colours. Um, so, so you'll go on to those red colours when you get like a proper SSW going on. This is getting nowhere near to that, just with these green colours. I mean, it's interesting though, but we are getting a warming of the stratosphere there over Siberia in October, which is normally a time of year that dramatically cools. Um, we see that that warming is further sort of uh, intensifying a little bit, actually, as we get through to uh, next weekend. This is 24th of October. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's not a sudden stratospheric warming. So if anyone thinks we're going to have a sudden stratospheric warming, we're not. We are getting a, war a warming of the stratosphere bow over Siberia at 10 HP, which is quite unusual for this early in the season. So this is how the extended GFS is looking with those stratospheric temperatures. So you see that warming does start to push in towards Canada, actually, as we go, um, you know, in towards the last stages of October. These are the closing days of October. Notice how this green area is starting to push in towards Canada. We've got a little bit of a displacement of the polar vortex going on here as well. You see how these blue colours, um, that's like polar vortex, had its roots in the stratosphere being sort of shunted over towards um, Europe and, and over towards northwestern Russia. That's a little bit of a displacement of the polar vortex going on, actually, at 10 HPA because of this warming of the stratosphere. Again, it's not a sudden stratospheric warming. Warming, but it is another the warming to displace the polar vortex. And it's quite interesting because it's very early to be seeing that. You'd not expect the temperature to be getting ever colder in the stratosphere um, at, at this point of the year. Um, look a little, little bit a little bit lower down to 30 HP. This is from the University of Berlin uh, with the ECMW. So this is the forecast temperature at 30 HPA in the stratosphere over North Pole. Hopefully they do sort of highlight where the North Pole is with this. is where that black X is just there. Um, we can see that, uh, again, at 30 HP, there is like a, a minor warming going on um, towards uh, the Pacific side of, of the Arctic um, at the moment. Over the next couple of days, over the next uh, week, 10 days, we're going to find that strengthening a little bit. This gets us to the 21st of October. That, does, that minor warming does strengthen a little bit over towards the Pacific side of the uh, Arctic. Again, probably enough to start displacing the uh the polar vortex slightly towards eurasia that's how it looks as we get um to day 10 which is on this chart is 25th of um october given this was generated uh based on last night's ecm run friday night's ecm run i should say so uh i mean it's what's going on in the stratosphere is interesting it's not a sudden stratospheric warming but it is enough to kind of start displacing the polar vortex a little bit at its roots moving it around and i think the, the main takeaway is that given where we are normally um calling things down very quickly in October, the fact that we're getting any sort of warming and another the warming to displace the polar vortex and its roots at both 10 and 30 HPA um, is is of interest and is quite unusual. Uh, zona wing forecast looking like this for the next six weeks. This is from the ecmwf.int. So at the moment, zona wings are weaker than average. Just here, the red line here is like the, the train. So you can see that zona wings should be getting stronger as the temperature gets colder at 10 HPA. At the moment, we've got weaker than average zona wings actually. And as we go through the next few days, actually, the zona wings are going to weaken even more. Um, so, you know, we have really got a very weak uh, zona wing going on there. That tells us that. Um, the westerlies are reduced. The polar vortex is weakened uh, as we go in, you know, through the rest of October. Into November, that's this period just here, it looks like we're going to see the zona winds getting a bit stronger. 
Only going back to average, though, there's no sign of, like, the Zelda Wings really taking off and becoming uh, excessively strong during the course of uh, November. But it does look like the Zelda Wings probably pick up a little bit as we go into uh, in, into November. But at the moment, I have a very weak Zelda Wing, and it is going to get weaker, actually, over the next few days. So what's going on in the stratosphere? remains uh, really, really interesting and really unusual. Um, we'll have to keep a close eye on it. Right, Eurasia slow cover uh, next. So uh, this is how things looking or weren't looking when we did last week's uh, update in terms of Eurasian snow cover. Here we go, Ben. So that's how it looked. We was, we did see, but had had quite a significant increase in snow cover across the eastern parts of Russia and a little bit across northern Scandinavia. That's as of Friday, the sixth of October. Let's see how things have developed over the past week. Three, two, one. There it is. So we've seen a big increase in snow cover across um, not just Siberia, but now pushing into such parts of Russia. Yes, there has been a significant increase in snow cover there. There has also been a significant increase in snow cover across Scandinavia as well over the past week, especially central and northern parts of Scandinavia. So, Russia and Scandinavia have seen snow cover increase over the past week. How does that compare to previous years? So, I'm going to get rid of that chart there. And uh, we'll see how we get on with these. I can get a little bit mixed up with my tabs, but let's have a look. So, this is how we compare with this time last year. This is how the 15th of October was uh, looking. And we can see that we have got more snow cover across both Russia and also Scandinavia than at this point last year. This is how uh, things are looking in 2019. So yes, more snow cover across Russia than 2019. Perhaps a little bit less though across Scandinavia actually. Uh, although probably quite evenly matched to be honest. That's 2018, so we've got more snow cover this year across Scandinavia than 2018 at this point. Probably quite closely matched for uh, Russian snow cover. That's 2017. I think we're very close to 2017. Let me know in the comments which years you think we're closest to for snow cover at the moment. I think we are very close to 2017 for uh, Russian snow cover this year. A little bit ahead for Scandinavian snow cover. That's 2016. What do you think about that? Well, definitely uh, ahead for Scandinavian snow cover this year to 2016. Probably a little bit ahead for uh, Russian snow cover as well, to be honest. That's 2015. We are behind 2015 for Russian snow cover, but ahead for Scandinavian snow cover. That's 2014. We're behind 2014 for both Russian and also probably Scandinavian snow cover. That's 2013. We are ahead of 2013 for Scandinavian snow cover and a little bit behind for Russian snow cover. That's 2012. What do you think about that one? I think we're probably quite close to match. The areas of the cover are different, but we're probably quite close to match 2012 for Russian snow cover and ahead for Scandinavian snow cover. We do well for Scandinavian snow cover, aren't we? That's 2011. We're ahead of 2011 for both Russian and also Scandinavian snow cover. That is 2010. What do you mean about that? I think we're a little bit ahead of 2010 for Russian snow cover and probably quite closely matched to uh, for Scandinavian snow cover as well. That is 2009. Now, this is an interesting year. Notice how much snow we have across Scandinavia at this point in 2009. So, we are behind 2009 for Scandinavian snow cover, but we are ahead, quite significantly so, for Russian snow cover. That is 2008. We are ahead of 2008 for both Russian and also Scandinavian snow cover. That's 2007. We're ahead of 2007 for both Russian and Scandinavian snow cover. That's 2006. We are ahead of 2006 for Scandinavian snow cover. Probably a little bit behind for Russian snow cover. That's 2005. We are ahead of 2005 for both Scandinavian and Russian snow cover. That is 2004, everybody. We are ahead of 2004 for Scandinavian snow cover and probably a little bit behind for Russian snow cover. That is 2003. What do you think about that one? Well, we're ahead of 2003 for both Russian and Scandinavian snow cover. That is 2002. We are behind 2002 for Russian snow cover, significantly so, 
Perhaps a little bit ahead, though, for Scandinavian snow cover. That is 2001. We are ahead of 2001 for Russian snow cover and also for Scandinavian snow cover. That is 2000. We're ahead of 2000. Whoops. We're ahead of 2000 for Scandinavian snow cover and also for Russian snow cover. That's 1999. So uh, with this one, uh, we're probably quite closely matched for uh, Russian snow cover. Perhaps a little bit ahead, though, for Scandinavian snow cover. And that is 1998. Let's have a look at that one. So uh, we are ahead of 1998, I think, definitely for Scandinavian snow cover, possibly also for Russian snow cover, or could be quite closely matched for Russian snow cover. Again, please, everybody, let me know in the comments which years you think we are closest to. And going further back than that, this is how things look in terms of 1997. Now, we're going to head round. So um, UK and Ireland is just better. Scandinavia is just there. Russia is just here where we've got this brown, yellow area. That's where we've got snow cover. So at this point in 1997, I won't compare now, um, but uh, just try and keep this in your mind and, you know, turn it around, perhaps, in your mind and uh, try to compare. So uh, this is how um, things are looking uh, for this week in 1997. And I think we're ahead of 1997 for Scandinavian snow cover but probably a little bit behind for Russian snow cover. That's 1996. We're probably quite closely matched 1996 for Russian snow cover ahead for Scandinavian snow cover. That is 1995. We're behind 1995 for both Russian and Scandinavian snow cover. There's a lot of snow piling up over northern uh, Northern Europe and also uh, Russia at this point, 1995. That's uh, 1994. We're ahead of 1994 for Russian and Scandinavian snow cover. 1993, uh, ahead of that year for uh, for Scandinavian snow cover, probably quite closely matched for Russian snow cover. That's 1992, quite closely matched for Russian snow cover, uh, and I think a little bit ahead perhaps for Scandinavian snow cover. That's 1991, uh, we're ahead for both Russian and Scandinavian snow cover at this point in 1991. That is 1990, ahead of 1990 for Scandinavian snow cover. Um, probably a little bit behind for Russian snow cover. 1989 shows that we are ahead of 1989 for Scandinavian snow cover and probably a little bit behind for Russian snow cover. That's 1998, we are, but we're ahead of 1998 everywhere. <laughs> That's all that needs to be said about 1998. That is 1987. Um, don't want to think about that one. Uh, we are ahead of uh, 1987 in all areas, really. That is 1986. Again, we are ahead of 1987. 86 for Scandinavian snow cover, probably also uh, for or close match for Russian snow cover. That's 1985. We're, at, we're behind 1985 for Russian snow cover, maybe a little bit ahead for Scandinavian snow cover. We're doing very well for snow cover across Scandinavia at the moment, I have to say. That's 1984. Um, so, again, probably a little bit uh, a little bit uh, behind 1984 for Russian snow cover, probably quite close to match for Scandinavian snow cover. That's 1983. Um, again, you know, uh, much of a much is perhaps to this year. That is 1982. We are. Uh, ahead of 1982 for Scandinavian snow cover, uh, but behind for Russian snow cover. That's 1981. Ahead of 1981 at this point in October for Russian snow cover and also for Scandinavian snow cover. And we're ahead of 1980 for Russian and Scandinavian snow cover too. 1979, ahead of that year for Scandinavian snow cover. Probably quite close match for Russian snow cover. That's 1978. Look how much snow cover we had across Russia and Scandinavia uh, this week in 1978. We're behind 1978 in Scandinavia and Russia. We're also behind 1977. And we are way behind 1976. Those three years, 76, 77, 78, so a massive early build-up of snow cover across Scandinavia and Russia. We'd already got snow line to Western Russia there this week in 1976. Wow, wow, wow. That must have been incredible. That's 1975. We're well ahead of 1975 for Russian snow cover. Perhaps a little bit behind Scandinavia uh, snow cover. That's 1974. We're behind for Scandinavian snow cover. And probably a little bit behind for uh, Russian snow cover. That's 1973. We're behind for Scandinavian snow cover. Ahead for Russian snow cover. That's 1972. Which we are behind for Scandinavian and Russian snow cover. That's 1971. Which we're also behind Scandinavian and Russian snow cover. That's 1970. Ahead of 1970 perhaps for Scandinavian snow cover. But behind for Russian snow cover. No data for 1969. That's 1968. Again, most of Scandinavia at this point in 1968 was covered with snow. But across Russia, um, not all areas, but we're behind Russian and Scandinavian snow cover at this point in 68. That's 67. We're ahead of 67 for Russian and Scandinavian snow cover, and we're behind 1966. 
for Russian and also Scandinavian snow cover. Right, we've talked for nearly 40 minutes and we've still got our soda special to get going. So I'll pause the video there and when we come back, the rest of this 10th update will be uh, dedicated to, you know, soda activity to, to soda cycle number 25. That'll be the rest of today's update and also the rest of uh, part two uh, tomorrow. So everything else from this point onwards is, uh, is soda. I'll pause the video there and I'll see you back in around two seconds. Okay, we're back and we're ready to resume the 7th winter 2021-2022 update part one. If you enjoyed the video so far, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much everybody for doing that. If you subscribe, you'll be able to see future web content, including future winter updates. So, as I said, this is a solar special. We've looked at everything else, you know, but we look at, you know, winter updates. But now, the rest of uh, this seventh update is going to be a solar special. Both the rest of this video and also tomorrow's video will be very much focused on um, solar uh, data and solar cycle number 25. So, I have changed over the GIF as well to show you uh, Richard's uh, special GIF for this video. Thank you so much, Rich, uh, for the GIF. So actually, you're going to see a little presentation uh, briefly uh, from... Uh, uh, Richard next, just to sort of explain the solar cycles uh, a little bit. So here we go. This is from Richard Short. Thank you so much, Rich, for this. Solar cycles explained. Welcome to Gazworthy's introduction to what solar cycles are all about. The solar cycle is an approximately 11-year cycle experienced by the sun. During the solar cycle, the sun's stormy behaviour builds to a maximum and its magnetic field reverses. Then the sun settles back down to a minimum before another cycle begins. Dangerous sun, fact. Uh, the sun is the worst place in the solar system when it comes to stormy weather, after all, and its heart is, is a huge nuclear bomb. The basics, about every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field does a flip. In other words, the North Pole becomes the South Pole and vice versa. The flip is one aspect of the roughly 11-year activity cycle the sun experiences. As, as its magnetic field evolves slowly over time, as the cycle progresses, the sun's stormy behaviour builds to a maximum, and that's when the magnetic field reverses. Then the sun settles back down to a minimum, only to start uh, the cycle all over again. What are sunspots? Simplest terms, sunspots are areas of particularly strong magnetic forces on the sun's surface. They appear darker than uh, than their surroundings because they are cooler. Even so, scientists have discovered that when there are lots of sunspots, the sun is actually putting uh, is actually putting extra energy uh, than when there are fewer sunspots. Uh, during solar maximum, uh, there are mo there are the most sunspots. During solar minimum, there are the fewest. From solar cycle uh, 24 to solar cycle 25. Solar cycle 25 officially began on December 2019 when solar minimum occurred, marking the end of solar cycle 24. Before the sun is, because the sun is so bearable, it can take months to calculate when the new cycle starts. Solar cycle 24 had the fourth smallest intensity since regular record keeping began with solar cycle number one in 1755. It was also been weakest cycle for 100 years scientists forecast so cycle 25 to be uh, to be fairly weak similar to solar cycle number 24. How long is a solar cycle? The exact length of the cycle is not always 11 years. It has been sh as short as 8 years and as long as 14. Wow. Uh, and on average uh, but on average is 11 years in length. Our weather, sun storms, flare-ups and eruptions. Our burning star may seem like it's a constant unchanging ball, always looking the same. However, just like planet Earth, the sun has weather. It has giant storms, it has flares, it ejects uh, huge bubbles of gas from the surface towards space and into our planet uh, as well. Some experts believe the more the minimum and the uh, little ice age uh, were uh, associated with solar activity. Times of depressed solar activity seem to correspond 
uh, with times of uh, global cold in history. Uh, the famous, most famous, uh, of course, being the Little Ice Age. Uh, between 1645 and 1715, during uh, what was now called the Maud Minimum, sunspots were exceedingly rare. Specifically, there were only around 50 sunspots instead of the usual 40 to 50,000 and harsh winters. Uh, for 70 years, temperatures dropped by 1.8 to 2.7 degrees during this period. Seven decades of freezing weather corresponding with the coldest period of the Little Ice Age uh, led to shorter seasons and ultimately of course, to food shortages as well. Conversely, times of the increased solar activity have corresponded with uh, warming periods during the 12th and 13th centuries, but sun was active and the European climate was quite mild. Experts do not know for certain, however, what caused this little ice age. Theories suggest that it was likely due to a combination of events. Some scientists are researching other factors, such as heightened volcanic activity, that uh, may have corresponded with the time of the Maunder Minimum. Fun facts, uh, sometimes the uh, spots don't appear at all. This was the case for 80 days of the first six months of the current solar cycle, which started in December 2019. It was greater still for the same period in Cirrus Cycle 24 when there were 281 spot free days. Uh, the period from 1645 1715 saw a near total crash in sunspot numbers, uh, where they could literally be counted on two hands. New information on Cirrus Cycle 25 in 2020 Cirrus Cycle 25 had 80% more sunspots overall than the equivalent period of the Cycle 24, suggesting that the current cycle may in fact be stronger rather than weaker. The International Solar Cycle 25 Prediction Panel said in September 2020 that they expect Solar Cycle 25 to be about as strong as Solar Cycle number 24. The consensus has not changed. Panel Chair Doug uh, Bicecka, I think that is, told all about space. The consensus is that the current cycle will be much like cycle 24. We have not seen anything that differs significantly in the early stages of this cycle. That varies from the panel prediction of a peak of 115 sunspots in July 2020. 25. The predictions are based on the 13-month smooth sunspot number, a statistical method for calculating sunspots, and have uh, and you have to be patient when studying the sun. As Bicecker said, uh, it can take up to three years after the cycle begins before we can say with confidence whether the prediction is still valid. So in summary, uh, we uh, can say that uh, so around we're around one year. In around one year's time, we should uh, have a feel for where cycle twenty five is heading. Uh, this was a basic look at uh, solar cycles, and uh, also Richard says many thanks from myself to Trump for compiling information from source references and from Gavin Partridge. That's me, of course, for his great video presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rich, for the uh, summary. I hope I did that okay. Uh, Rich, I hope I've read that. All right, I hope you're pleased with it. <laughs> It was a lot to read, so uh, <laughs> I hope I did that okay, everyone, and um, particularly Rich. I hope you did. I did your work proud. Uh, right, let's start looking at what's going on with the disc on our. So that sort of sums up, uh, you know, uh, solar cycles and sunspot cycles and everything else. Let's start having a look at what's going on on the solar disc on our side of today from solarham.net. Here we go then. We've got one little sunspot region just over here. It looks like it's about to disappear though onto the backside of the sun. Otherwise, um, we have no visible sunspots. And in fact, uh, Richard thinks that like today when you're watching this Sunday, uh, we will probably have a blank soda disc. We probably have no sunspots today. We'll see. Um, but uh, but anyway, so activity is at very low levels and is expected to remain at very low levels for the next three days because of that. This is the Gazworm's winter updates um, extended solar activity tracker extended, uh, extended um, by our good friend Shryan, Shryan Bruin sent this one through. So uh, this is taking us all the way from uh, the 1st of January 2020, just here to where we are right now. You can see that clearly solar activity is, is moving upwards. I mean, that's the basic um, storyline. The uh, red line should seven day average and the green line should 30 day average from where it was back in 2020 around solar minimum is clearly lifting up. Not in a linear fashion, it never does, but it is clearly lifting up. We are going into uh, more active 
state. He's full certified 25, as you would expect, of course. Um, although right now, actually, uh, the trends are dropping a little bit. So the orange line is our um, is our daily uh, sunspot number. Uh, the orange line, orange spots. You can see the latest spot is actually down here. So. We may even see that going onto the floor of the chart very briefly in the next day or so. Telling us that right now, solar activity is reducing slightly. But clearly the trend is upwards. And it was only like a week or two back that we was up here. And we had quite a large sort of increase in uh, solar activity. But, uh, yeah, you know, we're trending upwards. But at the moment, for the last few days, um, we've uh, seen the trend moving down uh, a little bit. But where we are in the solar cycle going, progressing ever on in so solar cycle 25 tells us that, yes, solar activity is lifting upwards. Now, who am I today? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Here we go, then. So it's Gav Ford. Or is it Harrison Gav? Or is it Gav Harrison? I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know. I'm 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 Harrison today. I'm so much rich. You're turning me into Gav Jones, Gav Solo, Gav Ford. I wonder. Thank you so much, Rich. Right, this is showing spotless days and the current spotless stretch. So um. Uh, for the solar cycle, so current uh, spot is stretched. Rich got that as one day, uh, because we think that like the 17th is going to be, um, you know, a, a spot this day for solar activity. Um, so for 2021 so far, we've had 60 days without sunspots, that's 21 percent of the year. It's comparable to 2020, which have 57 percent of the year without sunspots, and 2019. Let's get rid of those lines because I can't see, and 2019, which had. <coughs> I'm sorry, sorry, everybody, which had 281 days, 77% of the year without sunspots. Of course, our comparable year, so cycle 24, is 2010, and that had 14%, 51 days of the year without sunspots. So we are actually, would you believe this, um, we're actually uh, slightly up in terms of spotless days and the percentage for um, 2021 compared to the comparable year of 2010. Thank you so much, Rich. Right, let's just finish off having a look at some sort of cycle uh, data. Uh, Shrian has updated uh, all of our trackers. So uh, this is showing how Solar Cycle number 25 is comparing to Solar Cycle 24 and Solar Cycle 23. So uh, we're currently just here for Solar Cycle 25. The current Solar Cycle, of course, is just there. Um, that is, of course, uh, Solar Cycle 24, the last Solar Cycle. This is Solar Cycle 23. So at the moment, we can see that uh, we're around there for Solar Cycle 24, which compared to like the last Solar Cycle, we would have been around here, I think. So we're probably a little bit up uh, for Sunspot activity compared to Solar Cycle uh, 24 on a month-by-month -month basis, but not, you know, not overly so. We're very much comparable. I mean, we draw a line, we're very much comparable, you know, to, to this point. In uh, at the start or in the early part of uh, Soda Cycle number 24. And of course, we're well above where we would have been at this point in Soda Cycle number 23. We would have been around here, I think, at this point in Soda Cycle 23. So uh, if we draw a line from there, you can see that, that we're already way well ahead uh, of, uh, of uh, Soda Cycle 23 in terms of sunspot. Uh, numbers, but uh, but yeah, it looks like it's a relatively slow start to this uh, solar cycle. Uh, this is uh, showing solar cycles 23 and 24 compared by monthly sunspot numbers and uh, 13 smooth sunspot numbers. So you can see, but again, the, the blue line is 24, the um, orange line is 23. You can see, but again, you know, uh, we are a little bit ahead, uh, particularly in the last month, perhaps, of solar cycle number 24. That's where he was at this point. So cycle 24, that's where we are right now for, for solar cycle 25. So we're possibly going a little bit ahead of solar cycle 25 uh, right now. But they look like they've been pretty comparable. Early running with solar cycle actually is a little bit behind solar cycle 24. Like at uh, the end of last year, it was actually behind solar cycle 24. This solar cycle is down here. Um, and then we cross over just there. Um, and then cross over again just there. So so they're trading, uh, trading month by month, but not not greatly so, I don't think. And overall, I think this solar cycle is performing quite similarly, actually, to uh, solar cycle 
uh, number 24 to the last solar cycle. Um, this is how we're looking in terms of weak solar cycles. So this is looking at the solar cycle 25 compared to solar cycle 5, 6, 12, uh, 14, 16, and 24. So the black line is, uh, of course, so cycle number, uh, solar cycle number 25, the current solar cycle. You see we're right in the middle of the pack there with those weak solar cycles. So again, it is evidence that the solar cycle 25 is is performing in a similar fashion, you know, to, to not only solar cycle 24, but also to those weaker solar cycles. We're a little bit up on sort of five and six, ever two Dalton minimum solar cycles. Those two are down here. So as we lost with solar cycle 24, you know, um, we're a little bit up on the two dot minimum cycles, but but we're on a par um, with with the rest. We're on a par with sort of 12, 14, 16, and of course, the last solar cycle, number 24. So nothing particularly uh, um, unusually going on in the solar cycle, other than it is quite weak. And that's really summed up by uh, this chart, finally, uh, which is all solar cycles. And again, the black line is solar cycle number 25 just there. So again, look how we're, we're down compared to most of the other solar cycles. This is all solar cycle back to solar cycle number one, all the way down to solar cycle 25. Most of them now at this point in the solar cycle are, cl are clustered around there. Uh, and we're actually down here um, with the weaker solar cycles once again. Now, of course, we're still quite early on in this solar cycle, so we might see this black line sort of lifting up. We might see it taking off and, and moving up into these very strong solar cycles. But you get the idea from this data that by this point in the solar cycle, it generally the trend of the solar cycle is revealed, actually, uh, most of the time. So I expect there's probably one or two outliers that, that do, you know, that do this, that do sort of lift up like that. Um, but generally, I think most of those solar cycles are revealing their trend by this point. And we can see that the trend for this solar cycle 25 is down there with at the lower end. Not at the lowest. It's not a Dalton. It's not um, solar cycle 5 or 6. Um, you know, it's not down there with, with the Dalton minimum uh, duo of solar cycles 5 or 6. But it is clustered uh, within the, the weaker range of the solar cycles. And so I think we've probably got enough here to, to confirm, you know, what we saw in Richard's presentation. We've probably got enough here to confirm that this is going to be another relatively weak solar cycle. That's 24. That's how solar cycle 24 performed this thick green line just here. And we don't look overly different to that. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We might, you know, we might see something unexpected happen. But I reckon another of this solar cycle has been revealed now to, to suggest that this is going to be another pretty weak solar cycle and will be down with, with the, weak, uh, the weaker end, uh, weaker range of solar cycles, albeit not falling into a Delta minimum. So the, the idea of like the grand solar minimum that's been doing around for years and years, there's not much sign of that. You know, there's not much sign of a Delta, never mind um, a Maunder type solar cycle. But we're at the weaker end of the range, I think, again, for solar cycle 25. Uh, compared to most of the solar cycles, back to uh, number one. Of course, the reason we look at uh, solar activity is because there is a connection with northern blocking, especially when you are at and coming out of solar minimum. So you increase the chance through northern blocking of colder winters at this point in the solar cycle, you know, after you come out of solar minimum and move into the beginning of the new solar cycle. Right, and um, that's it, everybody. So we talked for nearly one hour. What an epic, epic video. Yet again, absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for sticking with us. I hope you've enjoyed our soda special. We've got more soda data to show you, though, because tomorrow we're going to bring you our analogs that uh, Terry, Terry uh, Scully has picked out the years that, uh, that are most relevant for this part of the soda cycle. Thank you so much, Terry, for picking out those years. So, uh, yes, Terry has picked out the years that are most relevant for this part of the solar cycle. And you're going to see the analogs data uh, from uh, from Gazwell Vids uh, based on Terry's years tomorrow. There will also be a little bit of a surprise at the end of that uh, video tomorrow. So stick around for that. It's going to be a very, very exciting video, actually. It's been edited by Savvy. Uh, 
Sav has been editing that. So uh, thank you so much to Sav. You'll see what Sav has been doing with the video uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. I'm very, very excited about part two of this seven winter 2021-2022. Okay, and I say there will be a surprise at the end of it. Um, and I won't say any more than that because I'll be spoiling the surprise. But there's going to be a little bit of a surprise at the end of that video. Right, okay. So that is it for uh, part one of the seventh week to 2021, 2022. Okay, we talked for nearly one hour. What an incredible video. I hope you've enjoyed it. As I say, nobody else is doing content like this online. So I just hope that you've all enjoyed and uh and if you have then please like and uh, subscribe and thank you so much everybody you're going to see future web content including future into updates if you do that i'm going to enjoy the rest of my birthday but i will be live streaming after 6 p.m so hopefully i'll see you uh for the live stream you'll have let me know on the live stream what you thought about uh, part one of this seventh winter update um but uh, that's it you'll be able to watch this video on demand whenever you like through the uh youtube homepage and the playlist for winter updates so uh watch on demand and uh, enjoy i shall see you at 6 p.m for my birthday live stream and you can let me know then before about this video uh, remember part two of this seventh winter update is coming up for you tomorrow at 6 p.m but at just under one hour Oh my word, what an epic. That's all for now, and thanks for watching.